but they made it easy on me. They said, you can have your cake and eat it too, and I basically become a day-a-week day a week consultant for Imagineering, and I did that for about 10 years. And that's one of the reasons you should all become professors, <laughs> right? because you can have your cake and eat it too. Okay? Uh, I went on and consulted on things like Disney Quest, so there was the virtual jungle cruise, and the best interactive experience I think ever done, and Jesse Shell gets the credit for this, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, wonderful at Disney Quest. Um, and so those are my childhood dreams. And you know that's pretty good. I felt good about that. So then the question becomes, how can I enable the childhood dreams of others? And again, boy, am I glad I became a professor. What better place to enable childhood dreams? Eh, maybe working at EA, I don't know. That's probably a good close second. But, uh, and <laughs> this started in a very concrete realization that I could do this. Because a young man named Tommy Burnett, when I was at the University of Virginia, came to me, was interested in joining my research group. And uh, we talked about it. And he said, oh, and I have a childhood dream. Well, <laughs> it gets pretty easy to recognize them when they tell you. Uh, <laughs> And I said, yes, Tommy, what is your childhood dream? He said, I want to work on the next Star Wars film. Now, you've got to remember the timing on this. Where is Tommy? Tommy is here today. What year would this have been, your sophomore year? Yeah. Oh. Uh, it was around 1993. Are you, are you breaking anything back there, young man? Okay, all right. So in 1993, and I said to Tommy, you know they're probably not going to make those next movies. <laughs> And he said, no, they are. <laughs> and Tommy worked with me for a number of years as an undergraduate and then as a staff member. And then when I moved to Carnegie Mellon, every single member of my team came from Virginia to Carnegie Mellon, except for Tommy, because he got a better offer. <laughs> and he did indeed work on all three of those films. So, uh, and then I said, well, that's nice, but you know, one at a time is kind of inefficient. And people who know me know that I'm an efficiency freak. So I said, can I do this in mass? Can I get people turned in such a way that they can be turned on to their childhood dreams? And I created a course. I came to Carnegie Mellon, and I created a course called Building Virtual Worlds. It's a very simple course. How many people here have ever, ever been to any of the shows? OK, so you have a, some of you have an idea. For those of you who don't, the course is very simple. There are 50 students drawn from all the different departments of the university. There are randomly chosen, te randomly chosen teams, four people per team, and they change every project. A project only lasts two weeks, so you do something, you make something, you show something, then I shuffle the teams, you get three new playmates, and you do it again. And it's every two weeks, and so you do five projects during the semester. Uh, the first year we taught this course, it is impossible to describe how much of a tiger by the tail we had. I was just running the course because I wanted to see if we could do it. We had just learned how to do texture mapping on 3D graphics, and we could make stuff that looked half decent, but you know, we were running on really weak computers by current standards. But I said, I'll give it a try. And at my new university, I made a couple of phone calls, and I said, I want to cross-list this course to get all the other people. And within 24 hours, it was cross-listed in five departments. I love this university. I mean, it's just, a, it's the most amazing place. And I said, and the kids said, well, what content do we make? I said, hell, I don't know. You make whatever you want. Uh, two rules, no shooting violence and no pornography. Not because I'm opposed to those in particular, but, you know, that's been done with VR, right? <laughs> and you'd be amazed how many 19-year-old boys are completely out of ideas when you take those off the table. <laughs> Anyway, so I, I taught the course. The first assignment, I gave it to them. They came back in two weeks, and they just blew me away. I mean, the work was so beyond, literally, my imagination. Because I'd copied the process from Imagineering's VR lab, but I had no idea what they could or couldn't do with it as undergraduates and, how, because their, and their tools were weaker. And they came back in the first assignment, and they did something that was so spectacular that I literally did 10 years as a professor, and I had no idea what to do next. So I called up my mentor. I called up Andy Van Dam, and I said, Andy, I just gave a two-week assignment, and they came back and did stuff that if I'd given them a whole semester, I would have given them all A's. Sensei, what do I do? <laughs> and Andy thought for a minute, and he said, you go back into class tomorrow, and you look him in the eye, and you say, 
Guys, that was pretty good, but I know you can do better. <laughs> and that was exactly the right advice, because what he said was, you obviously don't know where the bar should be, and you're only going to do them a disservice by putting it anywhere. And boy, was that good advice, because they just kept going. And during that semester, it became this underground thing. I'd walk into a class with 50, with 50 students in it, and there were 95 people in the room. <laughs> because it was the day we were showing work, and people's roommates and friends and parents. <laughs> I'd never had parents come to class before. It was flattering and somewhat scary. And so it, it snowballed, and we had this bizarre thing of, we've got to share this. If there's anything I've been raised to do, it's to share. And I said, we've got to show this at the end of the semester. We've got to have a big show. And we booked this room, economy. I have a lot of good memories in this room. And we booked it not because we thought we could fill it, but because it had the only AV set up that would work, because this was a zoo, right? Computers and everything. Uh, <clears throat> and then we filled it. And we more than filled it. We had people standing in the aisle. I will never forget the dean at the time, Jim Morris, was sitting on the stage right about there. We had to kind of scoot him out of the way. Uh, and the energy in the room was like nothing I'd ever experienced before. And, and President Cohen, Jerry Cohen, uh, was there. And, and he, he sensed the same thing. He later described it as like an Ohio State football pep rally, <laughs> except for academics. And, and he came over, and he asked exactly the right question. He said, before you start, he said, I've got to know, where are these people from? He said, the audience. What departments are they from? And we polled them, and it was all the departments. And I felt very good, because I had just come to campus. He had just come to campus. And my new boss had seen in a very corporal way that this is the university that puts everybody together. And, and that made me feel just tremendous. Uh, so we did this campus-wide exhibition. People perform down here. They're in costume. And we project just like this. And you can see what's going on. Uh, you can see what they're seeing in the head mount. Uh, there's a lot of big props. So there's a guy uh, uh, whitewater rafting. Uh, this is uh, Ben and E.T. Um, and yes, I did tell them if they didn't do the shot of the kids biking across the moon, I would fail him. That is a true story. Uh, and I thought I'd show you just, 